Hi all. Um, today I am going to spend a few minutes talking to you about dietary supplements. So I actually had this video that I did that was oriented towards women with PCOS. So this is just kind of a general overview of some basic supplements. I do want to say though that my recommendation is that if you're not sure what kind of supplements you should be taking, find a registered dietitian who can sit down and actually look through your personal health history and what your priorities are, what your health concerns are, and give you some sort of um, personalized approach or, or plan in terms of supplements and what might be best for you. So I always start out supplement presentations by saying they are not a substitution for healthy eating. So all the supplement pills in the world will not provide you what foods provide uh, what nature puts on this planet to hu to nurture human beings. And so repeatedly in many of my uh, previous videos, that's a plant-based diet. So the Mediterranean diet of which I did another video on is actually a really good example of what a plant-based diet looks like. And including a lot of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, poultry from healthy sources, and occasionally do whatever makes you happy is the healthiest dietary approach. But sometimes uh, we don't eat perfectly or we're just looking for a little added insurance that we are meeting our nutrient needs. So one thing that, again, I want to make clear about the difference between getting your nutrients from food and getting them from pills is that when you eat a food, uh, say you take a fruit or a vegetable or a whole grain or a nut, you're getting you know, what we know about, what we think we know, and what we haven't figured out yet about nutrition. So nutrition is a really young science. The first vitamin discovered was vitamin D, and that was only, I think, a little over 100 years ago. So the story keeps changing as our, as our knowledge and understanding grows. And I can envision a time in the future where maybe there'll be genetic testing to say, you know, these are what your nutritional needs are based on your type of genetics. I mean, who knows? Anything's possible. But I don't believe that supplements will ever replace what we get from food because Foods also provide nutrients sort of in the variety and the synergistic balance that nature intends as well. Supplements also don't provide the phytonutrients that fruits and vegetables and whole grains provide. So those are those healthy chemicals in plant foods that act as natural anti-inflammatories, natural antioxidants, and natural detoxifiers. So as is the case with my books, the PCOS diet plan and the prediabetes diet plan, my recommendation is to follow a balanced plate type approach to eating and supplement sensibly if you think that you need it. So I'm just going to go through a list of a few basic supplements. And the one that makes the most obvious sense to start with is a multivitamin. So I actually only have two, two forms of two different supplements in my house because I don't take a lot of supplements. I try to rely on diet as much as I can, as well as lifestyle, strength training, keep my bones strong. Um, the little added calcium is not a bad idea, um, but you know, I'm, I'm gonna touch on those uh, one at a time. You know, again, it's, it's activity, it's sleep, it's stress management, it's eating a plant-based diet with a little added potential insurance. So in my mind, this right here is a women's 50 plus advance. So you can tell how old I am, 50 plus. And, you know, vitamins come in regular old multivitamins and then they have women's and then they have men's and now they have for active people. I don't know if that's like athletes. This is a huge market. And so there is a supplement for, you know, every potential concern. Some people prefer supplements that are what we'd call kind of raw, made out of uh, food sources. For some people, that's important. For other people, it's important to have gluten-free supplements because they have celiac disease or uh, an intolerance of some type. The main difference between, if we talk about women's multivitamins for a second, between the ones that are for younger women and older women is the younger women ones tend to have more iron. Let me see what's in this one. Uh, actually does not have iron. So this is the one a day, like the CVS, which is a brand chain, Walgreens, Walmart type place, if they don't have them in your area, um, kind of a knockoff of a central multivitamin. So in all likelihood, the store brand vitamin may even be made by the same manufacturer that makes the brand name. 
So I often tell people there's really no point in spending more money. Go find the brand name things and then move your eyes to the left or the right and look for the store brand in all likelihood it's just as good of a product. So some people might argue with me about that. But again, I'm not relying on supplements to fully meet people's needs. So younger women will have multivitamins that have iron in them because they're still menstruating and they're losing iron. These supplements tend to have more vitamin D. So in both the over 50 men and women, they tend to be kind of your standard multivitamin with extra vitamin D added to them. And sometimes there's a little bit more, a little bit, a bit less of different things. You'll notice a lot of times in multivitamins, they may be large amounts, like many, many, many times the recommended dietary allowance for vitamins because they're really tiny and you can cram a lot of them into a pill. That doesn't mean that you need a lot more of those vitamins. You'll particularly see the B vitamins bumped up there. Um, both younger women and older women's uh, supplements will contain folate, uh, folic acid, which is the supplement form of folate, really important for women who could potentially become pregnant to make sure they're getting at least 400 micrograms of uh, folic acid daily to prevent or reduce the risk of neural tube defects. So this, uh, this over 50 version also has folic acid in it, same amount, 400 micrograms. But again, folic acid, uh, foods that contain folate, fruits, vegetables, beans, uh, you're much better off getting those nutrients from food. But again, this can give you a little bit of insurance. So in my mind, the main reason to take a multivitamin like this is actually for the vitamin D, because human beings, we think that probably 75% of people have inadequate or deficient levels of vitamin D in their blood, primarily because human beings aren't supposed to eat vitamin D. That's not how we evolved to produce vitamin D. We're supposed to get it from sun exposure. So given that we haven't evolved a ton since the Stone Age, our body still thinks we're running around naked, you know, close to the equator all year long, with all kinds of full body sun exposure. So I live up here in Boston where it's cloudy a tremendous amount of the time of year. Anybody who lives above the latitude of Los Angeles, Atlanta, Georgia, kind of across the country, the U.S. like that, uh, is not getting enough year-round vitamin D synthesis. If you wear sunscreen, which is what we're told to do as well, you also uh, will not synthesize vitamin D because the sunscreen blocks UVB rays. So you can take a multivitamin, you know, and again, you'll see all kinds of little add-ons. Sometimes they put little phytonutrient things at the end. They put things they call enzymes, all kinds of things that I don't think have a, a much value to them. I'd much rather have people eat plants. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about vitamin D in a minute, but I wanted to give you an option. So I figured my kids would be more likely to take multivitamins if I get the gummy ones. So this is Vitafusion, which is actually, I think a really good brand of gummy multivitamins. So the problem with gummies is that the gummy stuff takes up a lot of space. So there's not as many nutrients in gummy multivitamins. So if you look, at a regular multivitamin and a gummy thing, and you put the labels face to face like that, you will likely find that there are much fewer nutrients in the multi that's a gummy. So I think there are more, and there what's particularly lacking in the gummy things generally is minerals. And so even in multivitamins, you oftentimes will see 15% of the RDA or 25% minerals are a lot bulkier than vitamins. So it's easy to jam all the vitamins in there, but the minerals often, if someone needs a significant amount, they have to take it separately. So this Vitafusion has 1,000, uh, excuse me, 800 international units of vitamin D in it. So again, my main interest in having people take multivitamins is so that they get that extra vitamin D. And if doing it this way will help you, fine. Uh, but this, even the Vitafusion, which I think is a, a good vitamin. And the other thing you need to pay attention to with um, gummies is you often have to chew more than one to get a dose. So you always want to look at the top, see what the dose is. So this one has vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, niacin, B6, folic acid, that 400 micrograms that uh, women of reproductive age need. So this is a good option. Uh, B12, I'm going to talk about in a minute. Biotin, pantothenic acid, chromium, molybdenum, choline, good for women who are pregnant or planning a pregnancy. And it has lutein, which is a phytonutrient, and boron, for which there isn't even a recommended amount. So I'm not even sure what it's in there. 
they taste pretty good. A lot of times, uh, gummies, I think, taste pretty disgusting. You can take taste the gummy, uh, the nutrients in there. So those are your multivitamin options. You can either take pills or you can take gummies. Um, there is, Centrum used to make a liquid multivitamin, and I'm not sure they still do that, but that may be an option for you. So if you think you eat a good diet and you don't feel like you need that added insurance and you're not concerned about making sure you get at least that 400 micrograms of, of folic acid, then you can take a vitamin D supplement. So this is the vitamin D from VitaFusion. Again, two of these is a serving and that amount gives you 2000 international units of vitamin D. Vitamin D is it should be inexpensive because it's there's no reason to get fancy with vitamin D. This is Kirkland, which is Costco. So this is vitamin D3. So vitamin D3 is the kind of more bioactive, stronger form of vitamin D. So you don't need to take as many international units supplementally. So that's different from you go to the, the doctor, you have a blood test taken, the doctor says, your vitamin D level is in the teens or the single digits. You need a prescription of vitamin D for a couple of months. So they give you a prescription. You take 50,000 international units of vitamin D2 for eight weeks. And then after that, it's important to settle on a maintenance dose of oral vitamin D so that you don't get deficient again. So vitamin D is really important. We've long known it's important for bone health because it regulates calcium absorption and excretion. But vitamin D, there's receptors for it on every cell in the body. So that means its expanse or its action is much broader. So for example, we know that vitamin D acts as a natural anti-inflammatory. For women who are trying to get pregnant, vitamin D is important for the lining of your uterus, your endometrium. It's important for placental growth once you get pregnant. Vitamin D though is also involved in keeping cell replication normal. So some of the earlier interest in vitamin D outside of its role as a bone health um, you know, contributor comes from observations that the farther north people live, the higher the risks are of some cancers. And so sprung from that awareness came a lot of research from vitamin D researchers who were interested in the connection between vitamin D cancer and other chronic diseases. So I, uh, anybody who's looked at my bio, uh, you can see that I work at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston part-time. And so in the world of cancer prevention, which pretty much we're all vested in, vitamin D acts as an anti-inflammatory. So cancer is in part a pro-inflammatory disease. Um, it also is involved in keeping cell replication normal. So because cancer cells are abnormally replicating cells, we just don't want people to be vitamin D deficient. So I encourage my patients to get vitamin D tests. And this is actually a really good time of year to get a vitamin D test if you live up north because we've been living under the clouds for a long time. And now um, we need to kind of restock our vitamin D. So if you get a vitamin D test right around this time of year, right after the winter, it'll tell you, you know, with no supplementation and no sunlight, this is your level. Or with no sunlight and this amount of supplement, this is your blood level. So generally speaking, labs vary, but vitamin D, we'd like to see those numbers. Some labs say over 20 is normal, some say over 30, some say over 32. So there seems to be some variety of some variation in what's considered a normal finding. If you look at a lot of the research from vitamin D and cancer researchers, they like to see people's numbers between 40 and 60. So vitamin D, I just read somewhere and I I have no reason to not believe it's true that if you get the gel caps, those are absorbed better. Could be that they, they have some uh, oil in there that may help to enhance their absorption. But again, they don't need to be expensive. So this particular product is one soft gel has 2000 IUs of vitamin D. So I buy 2000 IU vitamin D supplements because I'm not very good at remembering to take them every day. So if I take vitamin D, you know, today and I forget tomorrow, I can just, you know, if I'm basically, so let me back up and say there's no magic number for an individual in terms of how much will prevent deficiency because we have different bodies and different environments. For me, I generally recommend people try to take a thousand international units of vitamin D and know that they will get some from drinking milk, which is fortified vitamin D by law in the US 
and you know you get some vitamin D from mushrooms and fatty fish and things like that. But that might not be enough for some people. And again, the only way to really know is to have a test. So I aim for a thousand a day, but know that I'm bad at taking supplements every day. So I buy the 2000. And if I didn't take one yesterday, uh, that's fine because I'll take 2000 today. If I haven't taken one in several days, I may take two of them. But what you do want to do with vitamin D is take it with something that has fat in it, because estimates are we may absorb up to 30 times, excuse me, up to 30% more vitamin D if you take it with something with a source of fat in it because it's a fat soluble nutrient. So vitamin D, you know, again, you can swallow the pills. These are tiny. Um, they are um, probably about the size of a pea. And then you can chew your two gummies. So I'm getting a question, um, is vi too much vitamin D bad? Yes, there is such a thing as too much vitamin D. People disagree on what that, that number is. So this the upper tolerable limit right, right now as it sits is I believe 4,000 international units. I don't think that's changed recently. I've read many things to suggest people can probably consume up to 10,000 IUs of vitamin D safely. I personally wouldn't go that high because I can't see any reason why someone would need to go that high chronically unless they were you know, followed by an endocrinologist or somebody who told them serially you need a lot of vitamin D. So, um, just because some is good doesn't mean more is better. So I think the only true way to know was to take a certain dose for at least a couple of months and then have a blood test. So that blood test will tell you the amount of sunlight that you've experienced without sunscreen on over the previous two or three months, plus the supplemental dose will tell you uh, whether that dose is adequate. It yields, you know, X uh, vitamin D level. So I know it's wishy-washy, but that's the way nutritional science is. It's it's varies from person to person. So those are the two big reasons in my mind to take multivitamins. Multivitamin to get your vitamin D plus a few little add-ons um, or just the vitamin D piece. So I'm personally very bad about taking the multivitamin, but I don't worry about that too much because I eat what I consider a pretty good diet, um, but I know I need to take that vitamin D. And I also have trouble... I do best taking vitamins when I put them in a pill box thing where I can see each day I need to take that supplement. So I try to do that in the winter. Uh, fish oil, fish oil may be beneficial for some people. Most of the research I can tell you is actually on people eating seafood and fatty fish. So the rec recommendations for heart health um, and other health promoting factors is to, to eat eight to 12 ounces of fatty fish a week. If you do that, in theory, you don't need fish oil supplements. There is some literature to suggest for people with very high blood triglyceride levels, taking very high doses of fish oil, I think it's to the tune of like 2000 milligrams of day, a day of combined EPA and DHA may be helpful for blood triglyceride levels. So when you take fish oil pills, most of the time the dose is two capsules. So you wanna look on the label and see and then you want to look down and it will tell you the amount of milligrams of fish oil. And then it will tell you the milligrams of omega-3s. And then it will generally indent and say this much of it is EPA, this much of it is DHA. So if someone had very high levels of triglycerides and they were told to take fish oil pills, they would want to be looking at the label to see exactly how much would I need to take to get that combined dose. Again, I believe it's 2,000 milligrams of omega-3s, but that's the type of thing that someone should have a conversation with a cardiologist or a nutritionist specifically to see if it's for them. I generally recommend people take it with food. Anybody who's taken them knows they have the potential to repeat on you, though they do have fish oil capsules that say enteric coated on the outside. That means there's a coating on the outside that makes it so that it doesn't um, dissolve until it gets out of your stomach and into your intestines. So you're less likely to get this fish burpiness, though some of them will just say, less fish burps on the label. So I'm not sure if that means they're putting some sort of enteric coating on there. Or they have some other mystery method to make it so you're less likely to be burping up the taste of fish. I personally think you're more likely to be burping it up if you take them on an empty stomach. Some people have cast iron stomachs and they can take anything. But again, I think most nutrients are absorbed better if there's food present because the food kicks up the digestive enzymes uh, to help with the absorption. Calcium, you know, calcium supplementation universally used to be a lot more um, routine. So I actually had a, a conversation with my own primary care physician about this recently and said, my impression is I don't need to take calcium supplements. 
if I take my women's multivitamin, so this has, I think, 500, yep, 500 milligrams of calcium in it. So it's about half the recommended amount. Um, once you get older, I think it's over 50, goes to 1,200 milligrams. Um, but again, you know, the best things for your bones is to eat a good diet, eat enough protein, eat foods that contain calcium, strength train and exercise. Those provide the stimulus to st strengthen your bones. If you do need to take calcium supplements, um, do know that it appears we can only absorb about five or 600 milligrams of calcium at a time. So if you have a multivitamin with calcium in it, and then you're taking a separate calcium pill, you do want to separate those into two different times of the day to take those calcium supplements. B12, very important for anybody who takes two very commonly can, uh, used medications. One is called metformin, which is used for diabetes. It's used in women with PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, um, to help regulate their menstrual cycles. Metformin has been around since the 1950s. It's generally considered a very safe drug, but it does interfere with B12 absorption. It takes a long time to get B12 deficient on metformin, but many people go on this drug and they stay on it for years. So if you take metformin, you should take a separate B12 supplement or make sure your multivitamin has B12 in it. In the case of this, I think it's 200 times the daily value. Uh, B12, where are you? Uh, this has 25 milligrams, which is 417 times the daily value. So metformin is one drug where you want, want to take B12. The other is this category of drugs that are acid blockers like Prilosec, uh, Zantac, Prevacid, those types of drugs may also increase your risk for vitamin uh, B12 deficiency. Um, I can actually speak from personal family experience. I had a relative who was taking both stomach medication and metformin, who was an avid reader. This was my uncle. And all of a sudden, you know, he was an older guy, but he was starting to kind of get vague and having difficulty reading and focusing. And I think it might've been my mother who was in a, a voracious reader of nutrition said someone should have his B12 levels checked. Sure enough, he was very, very B12 deficient, started getting injections of B12 and, and actually relatively short time was back to reading and focusing and, and like his old self, which was pretty amazing thing. So if you have an older family member who is starting to kind of act vague, I wouldn't necessarily assume it's just because they're getting older. You want to look at their diet, send them to a nutritionist if, if um, you have that ability and at a minimum, ask their primary care doctor to check their B12 levels. Probiotics, um, I, I'm asked about that a lot. The way they're marketed, you would think that everybody needs them. So as I said in the beginning, hopefully people eat a plant-based diet, which is the healthiest thing that you can do to maintain a healthy gut. So probiotics are supplements that provide um, uh, kind of microbes to populate your digestive tract which is an important part of keeping your body healthy. An important part of your immunity is to have a healthy gut microbiome. So probiotics come in loads of different forms. So there are some that are sort of single strain, like Culturel, for example, is a single strain of probiotics that uh, initially was initially developed, uh, my understanding is to treat diarrhea in people with AIDS uh, back in the early days of the AIDS epidemic, but is actually very good probiotic if it works for you. Then you have ones like Ultimate Flora uh, every day. So Ultimate Flora has eight or 10 strains of different microbes in 15 billion or more numbers in one pill. So probiotics, if you're taking them, you definitely do want to look and see what the dose is. In my experience, different things work for different people. Do I think everybody needs a probiotic? No, I don't. Uh, if you go through an illness and your gut gets hit by medication or diarrhea or infection, taking a probiotic for a period of time to build it back up may help. Probiotics may be helpful for people with irritable bowel syndrome and other gut problems, but other times not. So there is no, in my opinion, universal call for probiotics. If there's an indication, yes, not sure, meet with a registered dietitian and find out. What I can tell you is really, really important is once you're nurturing these healthy bacteria in your GI tract, in order to feed them, you have to eat fiber. So dietary fibers are like food for the healthy bacteria in our gut. So as I sometimes say to my patients, 
when they ask me about a probiotic and they're eating a diet that's high in processed food, I will say, may not be a bad idea to take one for a period of time. However, taking a probiotic without eating fruits and vegetables and whole grains and beans and nuts and seeds, getting those fibers is like buying a goldfish, putting it in a bowl and never feeding it. It's going to die off. So you can certainly eat foods that contain probiotics. So that would be kefir, yogurt, um, sauerkraut, kimchi. Um, cheese actually contains probiotics. I almost I always hesitate to say that because who doesn't love cheese? You still have to watch the calories from, you know, have to watch your portions. But in any event, those are the only things that I wanted to touch on in a general way. Multivitamins, gummy or regular, vitamin D, fish oil, calcium, B12, probiotics. Just a few closing thoughts. When uh, It's important to realize that the government does not regulate vitamins like it does drugs. So the government says to supplement companies, you know, you need to be able to prove safety and efficacy, but they actually don't test to monitor whether these supplements um, are, do contain what they say they contain, whether they're safe. Oftentimes when they end up pulling stuff from the market, it's because evidence of harm has started to emerge among numbers of people and then they pull it. So it's important to realize that there is no built-in government regulations around quality control of supplements. One of the things that you can look for is USP. See that USP thing right there? That's the United States Pharmacopeia, which is an organization that is a third party organization. They've been around for over 150 years. What they do is review supplements to make sure they contain what they say they contain. There's another organization called NSF that does the same. And I recently read about a third, third organization, but I can't remember what the name of them is. Um, and generally you want to take them with food unless for some reason it says not to on the label. And finally, you just want to know why you're taking a supplement. It's amazing to me how many people are taking supplements and they don't know why they're taking them. Um, or maybe they started taking them back in the eighties and they never thought to question it. And actually research has changed. We used to think it was good to take high dose antioxidants to reduce the risk of heart disease. Then we realized that it, you know, those were animal studies and it didn't play out in people. And actually there could be some potential evidence of harm, but people never revisited the issue, primary care doctor or a dietitian. So, you know, again, be mindful of the source where you're buying your supplements for, look for the USP or the NSF insignia if it's there. It is voluntary, doesn't mean that all supplements that don't contain them um, aren't good, but you can always call the company and find out. But don't assume that just because something is all natural means it's better. What matters is that after you eat it, it dissolves, it gets absorbed, and it ends up in your blood. I remember years ago seeing a x-ray of a colon with a capsule in it that had not dissolved. So anyway, that's all I have to say about supplements. Uh, I'll see you next week.